Good morning, guys. Hope you all are well and safe and most importantly, staying productive right now during the coronavirus um, sort of slowdown in the economy. A lot of you guys are still in quarantine. You're still at home. And today I wanted to bring Trevor and Mike together so that we could talk about what are the, some of the future opportunities coming down the pipeline in the sync licensing business. Um, we've talked about this obviously a few times before, but I think with coronavirus and obviously with everybody having to work remotely and um, a lot of eyeballs looking for new content and new ways to basically distract ourselves and entertain ourselves while we're all in quarantine. I think a lot of these future opportunities are gonna to come to us a lot sooner than we were expecting. And I think a lot of new technologies are going to rapidly grow and rapidly rapidly get more popular as a result of the coronavirus situation. So it would be smart for us right now during it to have our eyes out for those kind of things and to be looking for these opportunities. Um, before we get started, I know that there is a sort of been this idea or a, a kind of a meme out there that the money in sync licensing has just been steadily declining in terms of like per sync placement or per sync fee kind of a thing. Um, and generally I would say that's fairly true that like if you went back 10 years or even 20 years, you probably did see a lot larger single fees for a particular placement on let's say like an ABC, CBS, that kind of a thing. Um, but as years have gone on, what you've seen actually happen is there's been more and more outlets because it obviously started with the cable explosion in the 80s and 90s where now suddenly you have dozens and then eventually hundreds and thousands of these channels and opportunities out there that all need music, okay? So what happened was the maybe per placement money got smaller and smaller and smaller, but the number of placements actually grew exponentially. And so what you saw is there actually wasn't a loss for sync licensing producers. It was just that you had to kind of play more of a numbers game. You couldn't just rely on that one placement per month or per quarter to pay all your bills. You had to really kind of spread out your placements to many different opportunities. And if you guys have been following me and everything that I've done in sync my music and my YouTube channel, you're in a great position because I've always told you guys that you shouldn't be relying on just one sync fee opportunity or sending one track to one music library or one uh, music supervisor and hoping that you get that huge placement that'll pay off your bills for the entire year. It's just a very unwise uh, a strategy. I've always told you guys, you do need to have sort of a, a casting a net sort of a strategy where you are cranking out a high number of high quality. You don't want to just lower and sacrifice the quality, but just a high number of high quality uh, tracks to maybe two different libraries in the beginning to exclusive ones and sort of spread out your uh, marketability to as many clients as you possibly can within reason. We don't want to spread ourselves too thin that we're no good to anybody. But we do need to play a bit of a numbers game. And so you can't just be thinking that one track or one album is going to set you up for the rest of your life. So you guys are in a great position if you've been following my guidelines and my advice that I've been giving you guys over the years here with um with everything that I've been teaching you. But now what we're seeing is we've moved past, obviously, the cable, um, or we're moving into something new, which includes some cable um, placements, of course. But now you have, you know, streaming, and you have video games, and uh, VR, and uh, eSports, and all these other types of really interesting new ways to find um, entertainment and to be entertained for everybody. And so what you're finding is that number of places and those that number of opportunities for you to get your music placed is still growing. It never stopped with the cable revolution. It's just been continuing on and on and on. So yeah, while the per placement uh, royalties or the per placement sync fees might be lowering, what you're seeing is that your numbers and your ability to get your music placed is actually growing. So you won't be seeing, I don't believe, um, any slowdown in your income. And if you are, with whatever strategy you're employing right now, maybe this is a good time for you to rethink what you've been doing. And hopefully a chat like this can open your eyes up to some new avenues, some new future possibilities or things that are happening right now that you can get in on the ground floor and start supplying your music to. So with that being said, first I want to talk about um, eSports. So eSports is something that I have next to no knowledge of. I have I vaguely scratched the surface of what eSports is all about. So this is the main reason why I brought Trevor on today because Trevor has been following this niche uh, industry and it's a you know very, very big industry actually and it's growing and growing and growing. So And he's also been specifically looking at ways that he could target his library and his own music towards this uh, segment. So Trevor, why don't you give us sort of a rundown of first what eSports is, why it's been popular, why it's growing, and also, you know, how is it going to be really useful for sync licensing producers and libraries? Yeah, I mean, okay, so for the most part, people kind of got introduced to the eSports idea from like Fortnite, like a year ago, right? Like that, uh, that kid that won like millions of dollars winning the Fortnite championship or whatever. That was the first time it really like hit mainstream. 
<clears throat> but before that, you know, there was like Halo tournaments and, and Call of Duty tournaments, and it just it's always been around in the background, but it's been very niche. Only recently has it not been, and <clears throat> so much so that it's actually one of the one of the uh, the biggest esports games in the world has gets at the end, every year during the World Champion gets more viewership than all sports except for soccer and football. So um, we want to just make sure we get the definition there. So esports is essentially competitive right. video gaming, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. exactly. So, so it's so, sorry. So it's competitive video gaming, and it can be done anywhere, right? Like they'll do it in an arena, or they'll do it online against each other. Like the tournament can be wherever because it's they don't need to like like a basketball game. You don't need them to be there. You can be in your house, and they'll be in you know, theirs, and so on and so forth. They <clears throat> now in the past, recently they've been you know in an arena. They've had broadcast, you know, cameras and a show and hosts and all that stuff, which is just like sports, which means you need all the same things sports needs, right? You need, you need music bumpers, you need sound design in and outs, you need, you know, waiting lobby music, you need all this stuff. You need epic music for the promos that they play, like this team, da 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 da, and then this epic music or whatever. Like you need all that stuff. And the interesting thing about esports <clears throat> is that once once this uh, this this quarantine coronavirus stuff hit, nothing for them slowed down. The only thing that did slow down was live events, but they just transferred all of that to to internet and set up like you know like different uh, leagues set up the situation so that these players can play from home or in you know like small compounds away from people. So like only the team is in a compound and then they broadcast it out. But everything is done on the internet and they still need the lobby music. They still need, the, they're still making the promos because they're just editing video. They're still, they're still doing all of these things that need music. And <clears throat> the viewership has grown right now and is growing because nobody has, people don't really have much to do. And this is where I think the like opportunity is start to really going to happen because esports has had, it's like, like plateau for a long time of viewership. You know, you've got the players who like to watch pros, right? So they've been doing that for years. But everybody else hasn't been doing it. Like some people will dabble and watch football sometimes. Or a lot of people will watch the Super Bowl. But it doesn't reverse the other way. A bunch of people don't all of a sudden watch the finals of an esports because it happened. It's kind of been niche. Well, recently, <coughs> people like sport actual sports figures are getting into it because they have nothing else to do. So, like an example is there. I've I've heard of some talks of taking full NBA teams, giving them a month to learn NBA 2K. And then having them play games against each other and they play their own characters in the game and then broadcast and then like ESPN or whoever will broadcast it because all of these sports teams, franchises, broadcasting networks, they need something. And these players are sitting around doing nothing. And so this was like this, they're coming up with these ideas of having, you know, tournaments amongst real players in a video game playing against each other. I've seen, <clears throat> I've seen similar things where they'll, they're like uh they'll take like two iconic people like they'll say well like like uh like like Shaq and like some other center or whatever and have them both learn Fortnite and then do like a almost a like a, a pay-per-view battle type thing and you need music for all that stuff right there's all these things are starting to happen where video games and and, and like kind of American sports culture are kind of blending together which is creating this um this world of, of content whether it's you know, small or big, there's just, there's going to need to be music because it was, I mean, it's the same formula, different people, like all the big sports needed it and will still eventually need it again. But right now esports is really like really outfitted to do it. And so they're starting to do it. And I think we're going to see lots and lots of more esports type stuff um, that's going to be broadcasted <clears throat> and need lots of music. And I know this because I've even gotten a lot of like you know, because I was I was kind of like blowing this horn months ago when this wasn't the case, and I was like, "Look, this is going to be big. Here's like some music that I think will work for esports." And I had clients are kind of like, "Yeah, but we're not really, you know, we're not into esports or whatever." And now they're kind of coming back, like, "Hey, remember that esports thing you talked about? Well, our clients are shifting, and now we might need that project you were talking about." So, <clears throat> so it's definitely kind of on the in the, in the ecosphere, and it's just growing. And so I, as as somebody who I remember growing up being told, you know, video games financially dwarfs the music and movie industry and has been for a long time. The money in video games is more than the music and movie industry combined. And now that it's a spectator sport, that money is just going to grow. And so there's just a whole world of, you know, how it works, advertising, content, music, you, right? There's a whole world of like trickle down money that can go to you now as a musician or a composer or whatever that, is is available for grabs, especially now with, with more and more broadcast. So that's 
that's where I see this kind of going and why I'm really, uh, what is it? Bullish would be the term. Yeah. Like yeah. Bullish on, the, on, um, <clears throat> on esports at the moment, because I just, I see it just kind of going. Yeah. Now, what, um, are there some like, uh, cause when you said like ESPN is thinking about maybe doing this, I'm thinking like, okay, well, ESPN would be so stupid if they didn't launch an esports channel network of some sort right now, do they have that? And if they don't, yeah. are there any networks that actually have, like, we are one of the, you know, who are the big wigs right now that are like, we are the e shorts, e sports channel or our distribution outlet. Well, the cool, the cool thing about esports is that those distribution outlets kind of stayed within the games themselves. Um, for example, you know, League of Legends, the biggest game in the world, is broadcasted by the company that made the game, Riot. They have a broadcast facility. They broadcast over Twitch and YouTube and, and their own website and stuff. And they don't need a network. And that that kind of cuts out some middlemen. But at the same time, there are other events that I think will end up on networks. I do know that ESPN for a long time has had an esports channel, but it's been online and it's been really small. But that might grow now. But, um, and I remember too, because there was, there was supposed to be, this is how nerdy and how much I followed this thing is when Disney acquired, uh, Disney acquired ESPN, they actually gutted that because ESPN was going to grow it. And then Disney acquired it and was like, now we're not going to do the esports thing. So it got smaller, but, um, <clears throat> at least from what I understand, but now that's probably not going to be the case. And I could easily see ESPN kind of re like regrow that kind of channel and do like events and stuff like they, ESPN probably won't get distribution rights for like Call of Duty or League of Legends or Fortnite because those companies that makes the game that make the game, they just, just broadcast it themselves. But I'm sure they will get the rights to be able to do like events and stuff like what I was talking about earlier, this like head to head match between like the Suns and the Lakers or something like that on, you know, like they don't even have to play basketball. They could, they could be playing Madden or whatever, you know, like they could just do whatever. Um, I'm sure we'll see a lot of that, like on the major broadcasters where they're, you know, they're basically doing what they normally do, but a little bit different. Yeah, that's going to be huge. I can totally see that blowing up. I can see fans loving that. Obviously, kids are going to love that. Um, and, you know, that's a huge thing you said there, you know, video game industry dwarfing both the music and movie industries put together. We don't even really we can't even fathom that, like how big that is, because it's it's really just this huge giant um, that's, I think, recently starting to kind of show up basically in the fact that, you know, maybe even like five or ten years ago. Uh, you wouldn't think that, you know, even playing video games like on YouTube would be something you could do to attract viewers. But the number one YouTuber uh, is PewDiePie. And that's how he got his entire following. And now he's doing more comedy and meme reviews. But like that's what that's what his start was just playing VR games, playing video games. And people who aren't even gamers, I, I am one of those people once in a while, I will watch somebody play a video game. And I'm always thinking like, why am I doing this? Why am I watching somebody? But it's really because like their personality, their commentary, you know, it's really funny or something. Sometimes it is such a groundbreaking, incredible video game. Like right now, obviously, the VR content that comes out, I like to just see what's out there and what's happening. So I do think that there's, like you said, there's going to be a spectator aspect of that industry just glomming onto that already monster um, and growing it exponentially. So that could be the meaning that we as sync licensing producers and libraries either work with somebody, you know, that is broadcasting this kind of stuff or going directly to the creator of these uh, video games, these uh, VR experiences and trying to offer them um, our music. So you guys should be looking for that kind of stuff. There's a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline. And I, I definitely see the esports is going to just take over right now, uh, especially throughout the end of the year if there's not many live sporting events this is where a lot of the energy and the focus is going to go. So, well, thanks, Trevor. I appreciate that. Now, let's move into actual uh, just video games themselves, not necessarily watching people compete and all that, but the actual video games and getting our tracks into some potential video game um, opportunities. Uh, Mike Gennato is one of our Sync Academy pros, and he's with us today as well. And Mike is right now, as we are doing this um, interview, he's putting together a series of tutorials to show you guys how to create the, um, the the kinds of uh, assets and deliverables that you might need to be uh, used to making and ready to make if you see that there are going to be some video game opportunities popping up. So, Mike, I don't know all the specifics of that either. So maybe you can kind of walk us through about what exactly are you seeing with uh, the future of the placement opportunities that you saw and, and what exactly are you going to be teaching Sync Academy members with your tutorials? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> it's interesting, the video game industry um, in the way it's produced now, especially with a lot of the uh, bigger AAA titles and companies like that and studios, um, what's funny is um, it's almost like the bigger they get, the more ambitious their um, sort of projects become, the more Hollywood it's starting to become, you know? So it's kind of like, um, you know, 
of course, like with the advent of like, you know, a lot of like um, Naughty Dogs, like uh, cinematic type of uh, video games like Uncharted, Last of Us, that kind of stuff. Right. Um, you're starting to see these studios wanting to act and operate like Hollywood studios, you know, and thus their games start to become more like films and like shows. So what you're seeing like in, in um, a recent game that just came out, uh, Death Stranding, was a pretty interesting example of this. Um, there's also other examples like where um, like the Grand Theft Auto series and stuff, too, that do this. But uh, what you're seeing is you're, you know, something like Death Stranding that had a composer do the score the way a traditional film would. But then they licensed a whole soundtrack of label music, artist music, you know, and they sprinkled those licensed tracks in the game as well as promoting it as a soundtrack album, you know, and these are popular artists, stuff like that too. So that said, that's like, you know, on the, on the biggest end of things, you know, like I think that game probably, I think I had like an unlimited budget and they can do whatever they wanted, but like, you know, um, that trickles down to everything else, just like the same as any other, um, TV show or film or anything like that. So more and more music is going to be needed to either um, score these games, you know, whether it be through licensing um, or or actually just scoring. Um, but that's the interesting thing. So games work differently than you know. You can't just like think about music in a game the same exact way you would think about it in a TV show because it's the game is not linear, you know. So for a TV show and the background music for a scene in a film or stuff like that, right? You already see the scene, you know, the director might have an idea in his head or his or her head, like as to what they want to hear. And then it's just a matter of like, especially for licensing, it's just a matter of throwing tracks and seeing what works, what fits and stuff like that. Now, of course, like that led to um, a more uh, specific formula, which is what we teach as far as how to um, better serve a scene with music that you create. And also when it comes to licensing, how to better serve, you know, um, a varied style of scenes, you know, so you can have more licensability in your tracks. Well, with video games, it's, it's, it's interactivity, right? So instead of, you know, like in a show, you're following the camera and the story and it's telling you the story, they're telling you the story, but in the game, it's the player that's kind of like doing it. Right. So, you know, you can have a piece of music going and, you know, and you can have it like build and all this action and stuff like that too. But what if the player is just standing still for like an hour? You know, what if they went and got lunch and just left it on? You know, that's going to sound really weird, right? You know, with nothing going on. So um, the way games works is there's, you know, a lot of states and triggers, right? And um, so what tends to happen with the scoring is you have to start thinking of it in a more modular way, in a more, um, you know, smaller segment. So if you look at like some of the best scored games out there, they're doing little tricks like um, playing with stems along with creating like modular sections that they can switch between in real time within their audio engine. So the cool thing about the game industry and game development right now is that um, there is software like called middleware, um, uh, for like basically audio engines, you know, and these game engines are all free for you to download and just tinker with and learn, you know, like you don't pay for any of this software until you start selling stuff, you know, then obviously then you pay the license for that. Um, so anyone can kind of pick it up and just learn. There's tons of tutorials out there. Um, as far as how it affects sync licensing, you know, there's going to be the more games Essentially, what's going to end up happening is I think all entertainment is going to eventually become interactive in some way, you know. So we've even seen it like Netflix with, uh, you know, Black Mirror's uh, uh, Banner Snatch last year was probably, you know, choose your own adventure style of show, you know. And that's just the very beginnings of, you know, I know that they have other plans for more interactive sort of shows like that. But if, even if you think about that, like the composer had to think about like, OK, well, what if the um, audience chose this? um outcome right so i have to write another piece of music for that scene or music supervisor has to be like i have to license all this kind of music that works together but at the same time gives me all the options to account for you know all the different possibilities right so which is kind of game mentality you know um so more music is going to be needed um but at the same time it's like we have to think about 
how to create that, you know, again, it's like at the beginnings of sync licensing for TV, um, you know, at first it was just people were just throwing instrumentals out there, you know, and over time we started to, to develop like, okay, what works? Music supervisors started to figure out like, okay, this is how the sh track should be. This is what I'm looking for, for it to work, make my job easier. Editors would do the same thing in the game industry. It's the same thing. You know, you, you have music supervisors in games now too. And you have like, you know, the game directors, but also the editors are the audio implementers, really, you know, and they're the ones who can take your stems and your tracks, chop them up, however, you know, and then basically create the score. And essentially, they're not really creating the score. They're creating the method for the engine to and thus the user, the end player to create the score and mix of the music. Right. So it's kind of an interesting way to think about music. So there's ways to prepare for that. And I think that, you know, you're going to start seeing that uh, start to happen because again, like, you know, um, I, I do think linear storytelling might become a thing of the past very soon, you know, um, and you're, we're just going to have like mostly interactive media. And, you know, again, that's, that's not just gaming. It's also, you know, VR storytelling, you know, and other technologies and stuff like that too. So. Yeah, big point right there, guys. So not only are we going to be having more places to get our music, but each individual piece of content is going to need more music also. Whereas before you had the one episode or the one movie that just used its, let's say, 50 pieces of music. But now if we're going to have Choose Your Own Adventure and you can kind of see how things work depending on how you're feeling or what you want to see, well, now you've just increased how many different types of, uh, of code essentially are different layers of music you're going to need to have per piece of content. So that's why I've been seeing a huge optimistic future for us here is just these numbers of places to get music out there is just blowing up. And I didn't even think about that, Mike. Thanks for pointing that out. That Yeah, the choose your own adventure type of movies and video game or um, TV shows will also be seeing an increase just on the per um, per episode, right? Um, I want Mike. I wanted you to talk because when when we first talked about this, you had a great way of explaining it in terms of like if you were playing some sort of a video game where there was a boss that showed up, mm -hmm. um, and you kind of explained to me how rather than just let's say I'm a composer here and I put together some orchestral you know tension music and I give it to a video game rather than just giving them like the one two minute track, you had a great way of explaining why that track does need to be split up into maybe different sixteen bar loops loops or maybe even eight bar loops um, as why they need basically to have your track essentially split up into these deliverable assets so that their engine can play different parts. Can you maybe explain what you meant by that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, when you're playing a game, there are different states, right? Um, like if so, for instance, um, a common type of game is like a shooter. Um, so you have um, different threat levels, right? So you have like an explorative, like sort of um, uh, level where you're just basically walking around. Um, you have the threat level of like, you know, you see an enemy. And then of course you have like some of the highest threat levels where it's a boss fight, right? So um, you need to be able to have um, the music cater to that somehow. So if you write like a two and a half minute long track or a three minute long track or something, and throw it in there. Well, what if somebody's just like, you know, what if somebody's playing, they see an enemy, they're like, nah, I'm not going to fuck with that right now, you know, and just start, just keep walking around in circles. Right. Well, that two and a half minute track that you just wrote is going to build and do all this action kind of stuff. And the player's not doing anything, you know, so you need like whatever that ambient section or whatever the section is for them walking around to be 15 minutes, 30 minutes, however long that they, you know, they need it to be. Likewise, when it gets to another point um, where there's a lot of enemies and it's a long fight, you know, like you have the biggest action part of your track, but let's say if it's only for, you know, 16 or 32 bars kind of thing, then it ends right? But you're still fighting, uh, you know, that's not going to look right either. So, so basically, you know, the idea is you're creating these little segments, um, you know, whether in, that are loopable so that the implementer and the music supervisors can go in and be like, okay, this is for that state. This is for this state. And, you know, okay, boss comes here. It's a trigger. So in the game engine, it's a trigger, right? So whenever uh, a boss shows up or whatever they, they deem is the trigger, then it cues that piece of music. Now, the engines are so sophisticated now where they can, the, the, um, the new pieces of music or the new stems, however they want to introduce it, can come in on beat, you know, so it can come in on beat. And at the same time, they can, you can do things like crossfading, you know, you can do a lot of cool things like um, 
you know, like filter sweeps and any kind of effects, re big reverb, stuff like that, you know, and you can do all these cool transition things in the game itself to make it all sound seamless and smooth. So um, that's like really important with, so there's two things that are really important with, with trying to um, um, hit like the different states of a game. So there's that. And then also, um, if you have like an eight bar loop, you know, of course, if you have the same thing looping around over and over again, if there's a level that's taking a long time, it's just going to get boring. So on top of having these modular sections, you also uh, would want to think about ways of varying it up. So it's almost like thinking about a stack of alternate mixes or having enough stems like built, like really vertically building your track. So it's big enough to where it's almost like you have three, four different variations of that track going on in that eight bar, you know, and then they can choose like, okay, these eight stems are gonna go for this. And then when it loops back around, I'm gonna play these eight stems, you know, and it loops back around or play this alt mix, loop back around, play this alt mix. And then you just have this sort of, so as a writer, when you think about it that way, you know, for it to not be so jarring, you have to think about like, okay, it's almost like you're writing this really long piece for that little section that's really eight bars you know over and over again so you're kind of writing um you know maybe like one cue could end up really being five different pieces you know with, if you think about all the different variations and all that kind of stuff too so great way to explain it yeah i mean i think what you said before that you know this is usually we've been so used to this linear type of licensing and maybe this is now the birth of a new type of non-linear licensing so there's going to be probably non-linear licensing deals and contracts and assets and deliverables so i'm excited to see mike your tutorials i think we're launching them around beginning of may right is that what yep. we're doing yep yeah, yeah, so just a basic couple of weeks from now, guys, um, I'm certainly watching them all because I want to make sure that I understand all this kind of stuff so that if my libraries that I'm working with start realizing that they need to adapt and go into new directions that I don't want to be the one sitting there going like, I don't know, how do I do it? Uh, I don't want to have to be trained by them. I want to be saying, mm -hmm. absolutely, I've already I already know how to do that. I can definitely yep. get you what you need. Let me know how this is going to work. Um, uh, and I've already got the training to be able to do that. So that's the benefit of Sync Academy, guys, is we're keeping you on the cutting edge of the changes and the opportunities. Again, you can decide, do you wanna see this as the world is coming to an end and all the good old days and the ways we used to do businesses are over, so there's no use in getting started, or do you see this as settling the West, right? You're you're marching out into unknown territory. We're gonna make mistakes, we're gonna try things that don't work, but there's also a large amount of, there's just, it not only are new businesses and new, new content cropping up, but there's gonna be new industries, like multi-billion dollar, maybe even trillion dollar industries are birthing right now, they're, they're coming on board. One of the ones that I'm recently really diving back into um, is VR. I recently got um, an Oculus Quest headset. I was I actually had the D, uh, the DK2 developer kit two many years ago. I think 2015, um, and it was really cool. I was you know I was really interested in the technology, and I was just kind of playing around with it. And back then, it was really difficult to get it to work. I mean, you had all these cables, and you had to get all this software and stuff. And now with the Oculus Quest, it's just a standalone headset, no wires. Everything's wireless. You just charge it up, and it's incredible. And it even has this new update already rather than using the little controllers it can recognize your hands so you can literally put up your hands and have these virtual hands control anything in the virtual environment um if you haven't experienced it <clears throat> i will tell you this uh your reality is about to get very slippery <laughs> what, what we think is uh you know we we, we kind of take this reality as like well this is real this is all there really is um i know that right now when you put on a headset it's still kind of cartoonish and video game-ish and the graphics are not as realistic as real life but you will your brain will be tricked for a long period of time when you go into these virtual worlds right now today you don't have to wait a couple years to do this if you can get your hands on a headset or try it out somehow you will see very quickly that um, it's only a matter of time before these experiences are going to really shape our entire reality. And more and more people are going to be spending more and more time in these virtual environments, not just for a cool, you know, shoot them up video game or something like that. Those are really cool and exciting, but actually more for the social interaction you're going to be getting. You're going to be, and it's already happening right now. You can actually log into these virtual hangout rooms and sometimes they're outdoors, they're indoors, they're on the moon or wherever you want to put them. And you can walk up and talk to other people. People. They have their avatar there. You can decide to talk or not to talk to them. Um, and I actually just this morning was just testing out a couple of cool apps. And one is you walk into this um, campfire area 
and there are probably 50 people with their avatars hanging out. You can hear their conversations. Like the closer you get to them, the closer the audio, the louder the audio gets. If you turn to your right, you hear them kind of talking in the background. So you have this immersive feeling like you're in a place with other people. You can decide to talk or not to talk. There are people speaking all languages from all over the world. So you better believe I am looking to do something like that for us in Sync Academy, figuring out a way for us to be able to um, connect and collaborate in a virtual environment. Now, I know that everybody, the big holdup right now is the hardware. Not everybody has a VR headset. Um, they've come down a lot in price, but they're not to the point where they're like, you know, 200 bucks or 100 bucks. Some of them are, but maybe the ones with the advanced technology like an Oculus Quest is still in that 600 to $700 range. So it's not exactly available and affordable for everybody. But we all see what happens with technology. And now, you know, the latest uh, rumors going out there is that Apple is creating their own virtual reality glasses, though. They're not even going to be a headset, but it's going to be lightweight, something that you can literally just put on like just a pair of glasses. So this stuff is coming very quickly, guys. And uh, just get ready for that because you're going to... Um, uh, be very impressed and surprised and maybe even scared. I think a lot of people are gonna be a little freaked out about it um, as it comes on online and how it gets uh, progressively more and more uh, popular right now, especially with the quarantine. Because uh, you better believe almost every business right now is looking into creating like enterprise solutions for their their employees and their clients to be able to interact and you know point to a graph and, and uh, collaborate on a project or something like that in a virtual environment. So it's coming online fast. And that means just like we were talking about with video games and streaming and everything else, esports, there's gonna be a lot of music coming into the VR space. So um, Trevor, maybe we can start with you. Do you have any sort of predictions, um, thoughts? Uh, have you been following this industry uh, at all or closely? Um, and what do you see moving forward in terms of how music might be used in some of these VR and also AR experiences coming online? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I think I think a good idea is to like kind of like think of what actionables you can take when considering the three things Jesse and I have been talking or Jesse, Mike and I have been talking about um vr included because like vr you know the idea is like immersion right you're immersing yourself immersing yourself and so how so in your mind if you've got music how do you immerse the consumer how is your music going to be a part of that immersion uh existence or whatever and <clears throat> so when, when somebody films a score or scores a film they study other score film or films right so one of the things that i think could be really beneficial for people right now is to study these things and understand how music can and will work in these things and then be knowledgeable of that. Because if you go to like a VR company, right. And they're, they're trying to create some immersive experience and they want music to be part of it. If you don't really understand what that means, then you're just kind of showing up with some music. Like, Hey, here's a 10 minute or here's like 10 minutes of music, or here's a two minute track, like fit me in somehow, please. Like that, that, that it's not really appealing, but if you show up and you're like, Hey, my, I don't know if this is how it works, but you know, Hey, my music is actually mixed in 3d or in the surround or whatever. And, and we have everything separated. Like, all you gotta do is plug it in. And also I know the software. So I know that you just plug it into this area and you do this and that's how it works. If you are one of those people who can go, and I, I, I know this is true in video games, right? So in video games, um, one of the softwares Mike talked about was it's called unity and it's free and <clears throat> you can download it. It's super like, like, a easy to understand a couple of tutorials on YouTube and you got it. Right. Um, if you understand how audio works in unity, you now can speak the language of your client and you don't need to learn, know, know a lot. You just need to know a little bit. Right. So this is true for esports. It's true for video games. It's true for VR. If you can learn the language of your clients just a little bit, don't need to know. You don't need to be a VR expert or a gaming expert. I think it'll really help you not only <clears throat> understand what the client wants and talk to them well, but when you're composing, you know, understand like, man, if I do this thing, it'll really make it hard to like implement it in the game because I understand how the game works or implement it in VR because I understand how VR works. And that way you can really like the, that I think would, would help you stand out. And then, and, and it's just ways to, to, um, to just learn a little bit so that the, the actions you take now, um, don't like cause problems for you in the future. And then also it just makes everything easier because you can, it can talk, to these clients in their language and really apply what you have to them. Um, <clears throat> as far as, 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 you know, growth goes, like clearly the three of us are starting to emerge ourselves into these things, right? Like Jesse bought a new VR thing, you know, you're working on games. I've seen you on Instagram, Mike, you've got games up while you're playing, <laughs> while you're composing. So like, <clears throat> and, and it's the same for me. Like I've got esports broadcast playing while I'm working on stuff, right? Like I could be doing data or a song it's up. Right. So, and, and I'm, and I'm learning, we're learning these things because we understand one, we'll probably enjoy consuming them. And so we're fans in one way. And then two, we understand that we need to know this stuff 
so that we can be a part of it. And, <clears throat> and not for just for no reason, because we understand that this is kind of the future. I'm not, you know, like, I don't know, I'm trying to think of what a old, old media would be, but I'm not, you know, like buying a VHS player to figure out how VHS works with my music. Cause I like, why would I? Right. So <clears throat> anyway, so the, these things are like, the future and and it's it's clear from from like what the three of us have kind of seen and so um i don't know i don't remember what your exact question was at the beginning that was it <laughs> okay okay <laughs> that's very smart because not only i mean not only are you talking about like stuff that like composers should be having a minimal awareness of and um it's funny you mentioned unity i do remember i think it was unity i dabbled in creating uh video games years ago 2014 2015 i never got actually into the audio side of it though so you may you know you've kind of like got me thinking maybe i should download it again um because I, I had the fundamental understanding of how to create objects and create a 3d world and all that kind of stuff but i never got into sound effects or audio or music or any of that kind of stuff so uh that is a good thing that i should revisit and kind of figure out how to do it um but also i think this is for music libraries right now because it's actually more on loose music libraries to learn this stuff and at least get minimally educated on these topics because you better believe that some of these massive music libraries that you think are inevitable and they're dinosaurs and they can't go anywhere like they will go under very quickly if they're not adapting to the stuff and seeing new places to uh start marketing their music to or maybe even having to spend weeks or months repurposing a big chunk of their catalog to video games and rep and, and creating the new deliverable assets just like you know Mike and Trevor have been talking about. Maybe it's a, a surround mix, a 3D mix, uh, creating all these different sort of alt mixes that are gonna be really more specific for a VR experience or a video game. Um, this is really on music libraries right now to prove that they're going to be useful, <laughs> basically is what it comes down to. Uh, if you're not gonna be useful for where the market is, you will go bye-bye. That'll be the end of your career, that'll be the end of your business, um, because you'll be thinking in, you know, in 2019 terms when, you know, moving into the 20s here, it's not going to be the same game. Uh, yes, for a long period of time, I don't think like, I don't want us to get ahead of ourselves and think that like, you know, TV and film placements are just gone next month. No, that's going to continue on for a good foreseeable amount of the future. But what we're talking about, especially since we're, we have long-term mindsets here is we're not thinking about like, what are we going to do in the next month? But we're thinking about for the next 10 years into 2030, where do I want to be positioned? I don't want to be thinking about, you know, strategies from two years ago. I should be thinking about now, at least uh, putting some part of my day into thinking about strategies that I can start to employ that'll help my business, my music, my music library to grow into the next 10 years because you better believe everything's going to get disrupted. So that's really what we're talking about here, guys. And then last but not least, I do want to talk about streaming, just direct um, licenses to streaming companies because I know that's going to become more and more popular, uh, maybe even especially now uh, as maybe a lot of them are trying to figure out ways to ramp up their content if they can create more content or if not uh, Trevor made this point in one of our last chats that like a lot of the stuff that they maybe gave thumbs down to before they're like okay that wasn't that bad maybe we should kind of green light that bring bring that back because we just need something new and uh, hey let's just give it a shot maybe that was something that we because they do need to have new content to keep eyeballs engaged so that you know right now you got to think about every streaming platform is competing just for which app do you go to on your Apple TV or at home or on your phone or your tablet right that's really what they're competing for so they have to have something Something new, something exciting, some great content to be putting out there. So we've talked about this pretty much ad nauseum, uh, the direct... Um direct licensing model. And if you guys are not aware, that's basically where uh, Netflix has sort of employed this. has been one of the big companies that's made a, a name for themselves doing this where rather than involving the PROs and, and paying out back-end royalties, um, they'll just basically directly contract a composer or a producer and say, hey, we need a theme song, we need some music for our show, background music, whatever it is, and we're just gonna pay you a one-time fee um, for using that. And then we can use that track as long as we possibly um, need to use it. So um, I know that some people have been on one side or the other, or some I'm, I'm more in the middle of it, but I think some people, the, the opinions usually range from, that's terrible, never sign it, awful, they're taking advantage of you, to uh, that's actually really, really good because is, you know the royalties are really not that great anyways with the streaming platforms right now so if you're getting a chunk of money maybe a couple thousand bucks for a song that's actually a lot more than you probably would have ever made with your back-end royalties and then the middle is kind of where I am where it's like case-by-case -case scenario I think sometimes it does make sense to do that sometimes maybe if you're um, you know not interested in doing that and you have other plans for your music uh, or tracks like that and you feel like that's going to tie you up from other opportunities then maybe that's not a good um, fit for you so we don't need to go through in all the details but I, I just kind of want to revisit that really quickly with between you two, um, let mm -hmm. me know what your guys' opinions on all that are. So, Mike, why don't you start? What are you, what are your um, thoughts on direct licensing? Yeah, so um, I'm I'm more you know kind of like you. I'm in the middle, in the sense that like I think in you know so direct licensing is kind of um, 
that's how that's how the game industry works, right? Because um, there's no royalty structure when it comes to music. Because if you think about it, right, if a game is being sold for um, seventy dollars a pop, you know, and you do like a revenue cut on um, sales, like just freaking think about like how much money one soundtrack would make, you know, even if it's just a few cents, you know, uh, per, per sale. So, you know, a lot of times what they do is they just, uh, just to cut out that headache, they're just like, here's a shitload of money, you know, and then they're just done with it. And they try to, I mean, they don't account for the entire life of it, but they try to compensate well, um, you know, for that. So I, I think, um, companies like Netflix, I think, um, you know, from my understanding of and my impression of a company like like Netflix wanting to go towards a um, hey, we just want to pay for it once sort of route is like, let's be honest here, the all the paperwork with the PROs is a nightmare. You know, um, tracking is a nightmare. So it's like, you know, and especially from the network side, you know, and also from our side too. It's just like, well, how many times have we gotten music in a show, right? That's a new show, and then it's kind of just like, okay, great, I have all these placements. And then royalty statements comes like, where's my royalties, right? Well, you find out later that like, well, they didn't submit anything until the end of the season, right? So now you got to wait another six months after the six months of airing and all that kind of stuff, right? And then on top of that, somebody spelled like a title wrong or whatever, you know what I mean? So there's all these cracks that that money can fall through. Whereas I I think somebody like Netflix is kind of just like, well, I don't want to deal with all of that. Why don't I just pay you more? You know, and then does that make you happy kind of thing? So in that regard, I, I kind of like the direct um, sort of um, license, you know, um, you know, where it's kind of just like, here, here's what I have. And, you know, it's just a direct sale. But at the same time, like if you're talking about subscription models, you know, they are making money off of users every single month. I do feel like there should be some sort of a revenue um, share with all of the, uh, you know, creators somehow off of that too because you know the other thing too is just like um you know i think the the alternative to that is just like well then you know either that or start selling ads or selling ad space so that you know but then that can ruin you know the end user's experience if you don't want to if you don't want to watch ads kind of thing so but yeah my take on the whole streaming thing is i mean it's it's here you know so it's new i think that it's still hotly debated as to how to kind of like navigate that but i think it's that's just going to be what it is so it's going to be tough because it's like you know there's going to be so many there's you know netflix does what something stupid like 900 productions a year you know so that's 900 shows and movies that need music a year right and that's just Netflix. So now you have Disney and you have um, Universal. It's coming and you got Warner with HBO Max coming on and Hulu, and Amazon, all this kind of stuff. So it's kind of just like, well, you know, like maybe the royalty structure, missing the royalty structure might not be a, too bad because, you know, there's so many opportunities to make money with music. But then again, it's like, well, I don't know if all these companies are making money every single month. I kind of feel like I should get something you know, off of that too. So, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question because this is really kind of all, again, back to that wild west thing. We were, <clears throat> we were seeing all these um, companies just experiment with new business models. And we always have to remember, I know that like producers and musicians, it's just our thing where we're always very, you know, narcissistic and self-involved many times. Like, well, what about us? What about us? You got to realize like if Netflix goes out of business, there's no money for anybody. So we always have to have a little bit of empathy for the fact that Netflix exists. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing that these streaming platforms exist and they need to be profitable. They have to make profits if they're going to stay in business and if they're going to allow for new places for our music to get distributed. So we got to remember, even though, you know, obviously we're always looking out for ourselves as producers, it is a team sport. This requires everybody to do it. So there's going to be different companies trying different models. And just like Mike was talking about there, they um you know I, I know right now when they let's say they go bring on a Chappelle for a, a comedy special as far as i understand it they're paying him millions and millions of dollars but i don't believe there's a back end royalty associated with that i could be mistaken on that but i from what i hear they're just doing sort of the upfront one time fee and so they're probably going to want to do that model for all content creators music you know video actors comedians that kind of thing so i'm thinking that's where they want to go but then we still don't know is Netflix going to make it? I mean, if they're making that much content, spending that much money, are their subscriptions going to justify them staying in business? So we don't even know actually about that because we all have kind of, some of us have been following that Netflix is not, you know, they're in a lot of debt. They have a lot of uh, a lot of expenses. And, you know, are they going to pull through with this when they're competing against this show right here, guys? We are competing against Netflix because at the end of the day, it's just about minutes, eyeballs watching minutes of some sort of content. And this 
cost nothing for us to put together. We have free Google Hangouts. I'm recording with OBS, which was free. And this is just us sort of sharing our thoughts. And we have now taken up, thank you guys, we've taken up about an hour of your time, which you could have spent watching Netflix or Amazon or any of that kind of stuff. So are, is that is their business model gonna thrive when there's other places to get content that costs next to nothing to produce? So this is all remains to be seen. But anyways, uh, Trevor, I wanna get your thoughts on the direct um, licensing situation. <clears throat> Yeah, I think we, we talked about this a little bit in a, in a past video. So I'll go over like my, my like kind of idea of, of, of that. And then I want to get into something that, you know, hold on to your seats a little bit. It's a little weird, but I, I want to kind of talk about blockchain a little bit on this scenario of streaming. Cause I think that that might be a problem solver, but you have to kind of get people to adapt anyway. So direct licensing. And the reason why I, so I set up my company to basically, I, I, if there's any direct licensing, I just pay the composers or the, the writers a portion of the direct license. A lot of libraries won't do that. I did it because I saw this coming, right? I saw that Netflix or some video game or whoever comes after Netflix, a lot of these companies are thinking long-term of, well, I don't want to pay, pay for this for the rest of its existence, right? I don't want to have a little bit of money trickling out of the show for musicians or actor royalties or whatever other people get these little like, you know, royalties. And so I see that I understood that like, okay, if I were Netflix, I wouldn't want to do it. So, you know, I can't be really that mad at them. But, and then they also, they, they do what, um, what Mike was saying. They're like, you know what, we'll just pay a little bit more upfront. And this is true. I've worked, I've, I've licensed something to Netflix and have seen licenses in other, in other streaming platforms. And it's kind of the same thing. It's, we, uh, <clears throat> we'll just pay you a little bit more now. So we don't have to worry about the trickling for the rest of it, the existence of the, of, of the show or movie or whatever. And it probably works well for them that way. Less headache for everybody involved. Like he said, the, like one of my biggest problems, which I'll, I'll segue into the, the other thing is the PRO system. I've, I liked it in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways, it's just, it's a mess. It's a lot of just like literally like paperwork, hard paper sheets scanned and then sent in and stuff like, a lot of paperwork and a lot of, of errors, you know, somebody just, I mean, your CAE number is like seven to 10 numbers. You mess one up, like be a minor guys cap or whatever. Just be like, yeah, I don't know who to pay. Even though if you look at it, you're like, clearly it's me, you know what I mean? But like my, my name's on there. The numbers went off. Like they're just like, Nope, we're not going to spend the time to try and figure out what went wrong here. No money for you. Like, and that's, that's just human error stuff. That's not like to, to trash on BMI or ASCAP or whatever. That's just, is a human error issue in a human, you know, very human heavy environment. Now, when, when I went down this rabbit hole of, of blockchain and, and crypto and all that stuff, I discovered that like the PRS system works just like a blockchain, but with people and <clears throat> learning what me, if media and rights are on a blockchain together or some form of blockchain, blockchain is a buzzword, but there's other technologies just like this where media and rights are on the tech together on tech then you have no, you don't need people because it's all in a math problem where if, if a TV show has your rights attached to it and it's within a system of right man, rights management digitally, then you get paid like, like instantly someone hits pay play. You get paid because it's all done through the mathematic equation of these people have this, right? These people have this, right? It's all attached this to the video file and it's all attached together. And then the blockchain or whatever it is, spits it all out. Every time somebody hits play or at the end of every month, once all the money is accumulated into an account and then, you know, all the rights, you know, contract, they're called like smart contracts, all that kind of gets distributed automatically because it's all within an algorithm that is set in stone. And then you get your cuts and it all goes to you like instantly digitally. And not a single person has to touch it once it is set up and thrown into the system. And I could easily, like, I could see some of these companies like, cause you're right company like Netflix and Spotify, for example, are in lots of debt and aren't making money right now, but they are spending a lot of money. They are the top dogs. They have all the eyeballs. I could see other companies or even then themselves adopting some sort of system like this, where it all automatically does it for you. And not just because there's music people involved. There's so many rights holders when it comes to a movie or a TV show. It's insane. There's, there's, I mean, act, a lot of actors get royalties, a lot of uh, uh, different like executive producers or directors or like there's an insane amount of people who are all involved and can be rights owners in this thing. I, 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 I'm watching this scenario of, yes, we have Netflix where they just pay everybody out and then they don't have to worry about it. And then the only rights owner at the end of the day, but I could easily see a video game company or a smaller media company who has TV shows creating great content where 
all these people are rights owners in the content. And then you have content where you actually know you get, you're going to get per play money because it's all digitally distributed and in an ecosystem that allows for that. And so <clears throat> I say all that because I think as, as like somebody who's looking at this industry, yes, the Netflix exists, may, people will be making those deals, but watch out for these because these might be really cool for you and really fast paced where you're like getting your royalties tomorrow or at the end of the month instead of a year from now because it's all done digitally and, 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 um, set up beforehand. So anyway, one <laughs> went down that road a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah. No, it's, it's something I have, um, I haven't looked much into recently. Uh, years ago, I really got into obviously Bitcoin and, and all the other alt currencies yeah. that came out, but, mm -hmm. um, it's been something that's gotten massively more complicated and massively uh, more popular too, in the last couple of years. And, mm -hmm. uh, I think, yeah, with that blockchain, uh, technology, it's definitely going to enter our space in one way or another. And it'll probably start off as some sort of like, Oh, this experimental company is trying this thing out and everybody will laugh <laughs> at it and like, ah, it's not going to work. Yeah. And you'll see how quickly it's like, well, actually kind of is fair. You get paid faster. No errors are very minimal errors um because yeah you know you made me think trevor like how many billions of dollars have been lost from the pro system i don't know you know who knows <laughs> it's that's just the pr system too yeah. there's all these other rights holders like i know that like sag uh actors and stuff like they have their own royalty system and i'm sure there's money lost there too like i'm sure it's a lot guaranteed I, yeah and, and if i can add something uh to yeah. this really quick um so I think, um, cause I've been following this sort of problem for a while now too. And I think especially when it comes, I don't know about any other form, like, uh, any other aspects of the entertainment industry, uh, like with actors and stuff, but I know when it comes to music, one of the biggest hurdles and obstacles is the fact that like, there's no centralized database for every piece of copyright of music that's out there. You know, there's a data, like one company, one big conglomerate has one database, another conglomerate has another data. So if you think about like the airline industry, right. A, you know, a site like Kayak can exist because it's reading information from Saber, which is one database of all the airline mm -hmm. tickets for the entire industry. So if that problem can be solved, then I think like that opens the door for like, okay, we have one database that everything is feeding into. And then there's one, you know, then you can create everything on top of that basically. So now I know that I also know, but having followed this, there's a ton of politics involved because, um, Sony wants to create that database. So does universal, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> everybody have, wants to grab onto that. Yeah. yeah. And they all have their own catalogs of music, right. Within their own database. So each one of them wants to be the standard. So it's kind of like for there to be one database, they have to kind of work it out to be like, well, you got to put your music into my data. And then the other one's like, well, no, well, we think your music should go into our database. You know what I mean? So it's like <laughs> fighting over the one ring. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. And so they're going to be, yeah, they're going to be going for that. Maybe the solution will be they'll have to meet in the middle and be like, we're going to create a new, you know, yeah. shared conglomerate. And this is going to be the thing that we partner with or all the sort of major players have to get together and go like, all right, nobody's winning this, but we're all going to get a piece of it. We're all going to contribute it to it. And just collaborate to make sure usually i think that's how a lot of things work out for technology and new standards and stuff it's like everybody's going okay we want this to be the standard no we want this and at some point everybody kind of just goes all right let's just figure this out let's all collaborate because if we can't agree on the standard then the industry just dies basically yeah. because we don't want a million different people searching in a million different areas to to get the solution we want to be able to make sure that everybody who needs to use music can get it quickly can license it quickly and so it's in everybody's interest to collaborate on this and try to share it so yeah we'll see uh, how that works out that's a really great point so well, thank you, uh, Mike and Trevor. I really appreciate your guys' insights. And once again, this is the smartest video, the smartest podcast, the smartest source of information for the future of sync licensing and what you guys should be thinking about right now, how you should be getting yourself educated for preparing yourself for not just next week, next month, but the next 10 years, the next 20 years moving into the future. There's going to be some incredible new technologies that are going to blow our minds. And if we want to survive and not only, you know, Get, get by with all this new stuff happening, but we want to actually thrive and grow our businesses, grow our catalog, grow our, our music, our royalties, sync fees, all that good stuff. You got to look for the opportunities. You can't just think that it's too scary, it's too weird, it's too new, and just sort of put your head in the sand and pretend that it'll all just, it's just kind of a fad. Well, remember how people felt about the internet, you know, and about email and, you know, all those sort of like, ah, it's just a fad, it'll go away. 
those people got blown away. I mean, they just got left in the dust and their industries and their, um, you know, their, their businesses completely crumbled. So you don't want to be one of those. Let's learn from history that this technology is here. It's here to stay. It's going to grow. There's going to be weird mutations of everything. And also technologies interacting and merging with each other that we never thought could interact or merge with each other. So that's going to also birth new things. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm along for the ride. It's going to be weird. It's going to be uh, unnatural in many ways. But um, I think as long as you sort of look for the opportunities, I think you'll be able to do all right in this kind of thing. And um, just to sort of prepare yourself mentally to know that like the old ways of doing business might and probably won't be moving forward into the future. So just don't think that if there's a new licensing contract your way or a library asks you to do a kind of a new gig and it doesn't look exactly like what we've been doing, don't just immediately dismiss it and go, well, that's just a ripoff. I should never do that. And the same thing that we were talking about with Netflix. Um, try to see it as sort of a, um, a different approach, a different model that will probably have its pros or cons. And yeah, some of them will be probably really terrible deals and you might not want to deal with them, but some of them might set you up for a really great position to be very, very wealthy in the future. And if you're not seeing that, you're not actually like looking forward in the future and also having that long-term mindset, you're going to completely miss out on that. So thank you guys so much. I appreciate your time. And thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for listening to the Sync My Music podcast. If you enjoyed the show and want me to do more episodes, all that I ask is that you leave me a review on whatever platform or app that you're listening to. It just takes a few seconds. I'll never charge for this podcast and I want to keep it 100% ad free. And your review right now will help me do just that. Thank you so much. Bye.